Uh, welcome, thank you for coming. Uh, please will be a short talk about application design and our approach to make it easier and uh, more enjoyable. Um, in case something uh, is not clear, please um, ask your questions after the talk. Uh, so, um, first of all, uh, let us introduce ourselves. We are Paul and Kai, and we are from Septal Mind, an Irish software development consultant. So we are fo uh, focusing on engineer productivity and team efficiency, and we are big fans of Scala and pure functional programming. Also, uh, we are participants and con contributors of different Scala projects. So, what uh, do we usually do for our clients? We identify productivity issues in their uh, SDLC pipelines and we build tools to address uh, these issues. Uh, so, uh, over years we have evolved our formula of productivity. Key parts of uh, our approach are Scala and Bifunctor-based encoding for errors. Originally, we've been using Scalactic uh, when we tried to build um, our own defunct IO, then adopted Zio um, since the very, uh, the very first public alpha. Uh, Zio closed the everlasting question of uh, the error encoding, but there were our questions. Uh, the primary question was how do we design complex like thousands of components but uh, at the same time extensible applications uh, to benefit from functional programming not suffer uh, and the answer was always uh, obvious and boring uh, we needed modules and modularity uh, well modules are independent and reusable building blocks but uh, how should we represent them in our functional programming environment uh, we understood that there are two answers they should combine together dependency injection and tagless final style uh, when i say uh, dependency injection i mean exactly what you just taught the classic dependency injection but uh, we needed something a lot more powerful when Spring or Juice or whatever. So, in the end, we made our own little framework uh, named Izumi, uh, consisting of two key libraries, DStage and BO. Uh, DStage is the most advanced and the most powerful dependency injection mechanism, and BO is a set of cuts styled type classes for B functors and P functors. Also, our framework contains several uh, our useful things. So, uh, what is Vue? Vue provides you a robust uh, set of abstractions uh, which you may use to make your code cleaner, separate concerns, and get all uh, the other benefits of tagless final style. Bifunctor type classes have uh, Zio and Monix implementations. Three functor ones rely purely on Zio at this point. Uh, we also expect to incorporate Vio into Zio Prelude in foreseeable future. Uh, and let's talk about this stage. This stage, as I said before, uh, a dependency injection library, but it can do orders of magnitude more than your typical DI. First of all, it can run inside an IO monad. It is loaded with many useful features like role-based applications, resources and life cycles, integration checks, a test kit with correct and efficient minimization, introspection tools, and many other things. So, uh, we have shown uh, many stage capabilities in our previous talks, and today we will focus on uh, the most important feature of this stage. Um, we call it configurable applications. Um, this feature was available um, in this stage for a while. But since uh, version 1.0, it supports complete compile time verification. Uh, this is a very advanced state of the art technology, and it makes this stage the most advanced dependency injection tool available for Scala or any other platform. So, what is a configurable application? A configurable application is an application which can accept several flags when it starts. The application should then choose correct component implementations, uh, initialize these components, uh, also all the components uh, which are not transitively required for this particular configuration should be ignored and the application should not allow the user to run itself with an unsound set of flags. 
Uh, a typical example of such plugs would be a purpose plug uh, with typical values like test and production, and uh, for example, a database plug with values like Postgres or uh, end dummy. So, um, for example, the user may tell the application to start in test mode with Postgres or dummy in memory database or in production mode with Postgres database. Uh, so here is a component diagram of such an application. Uh, so our imaginary application has two services, uh, users service and accounts one. Each service uh, uses an abstract interface um, of a corresponding repository. Each repository um, has three different implementations, uh, Postgres, Oracle and the memory. Mm, also, the application uses a payments gateway interface, which has two implementations, a mock and the Stripe one. Uh, this app has two so-called mode axes or flags, the purpose axis with values production and test, and database axis with values Postgres, Oracle, and Dummy. Uh, we also want to be able to define some constraints, like we may wish to allow the user to run the application tests with Postgres or Dummy database, but never with Oracle. And we also never want to run tests with production payment service. And also, we may wish to have defaults. For example, in case we run uh, the application in production mode uh, without specifying the database access, it should use Postgres. Um, so, um, uh, there was no uh, good way to write configurable applications. Um, the requirements uh, and constraints are easy to pronounce, but were notably hard to implement, uh, especially to implement in an extensible manner. And engineers who try to do it often suffer from exponential growth of code paths, and it's always very hard to check that all the possible configurations are correct. So, um, even if you don't have transitive dependencies and uh, dependent constraints, configurable applications are hard, and compile time guarantees were considered impossible. Uh, so, here is a snippet showing a typical code which may be written uh, by someone who tries to implement the app I've described before. Uh, as you can see, it looks a little bit dirty and repetitive, and uh, there are two runtime exceptions blocking incorrect configurations. So uh, even this snippet looks bad, but um, it's a total nightmare when you have a couple of dozens of them and we depend on each other. So, um, configurable applications were enabled by the stage. The stage made them possible. Uh, though some people criticize the stage because um, all the contracts related to configurability were checked in runtime. Uh, it worked. It worked a lot better when our runtime tools like Juice or Spring or whatever. Uh, because this stage is unique, it is staged, uh, and it plans all the job first and only then performs it. So uh, the contracts were checked very early, but still in runtime. time. And some people dislike just the idea of doing things in runtime. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the problem of providing compile time guarantees for configurable applications had been considered uh, practically impossible by many people, and we thought the same, though we were wrong. So, um, at this point, I'm going to pass. Um, <coughs> uh, <coughs> I'm going to pass the presentation to Kai. Uh, over the last uh, couple of months, uh, he uh, has been polishing uh, our um, external APIs for the uh, compile time checks, and he will continue from this point. Hello.
So uh, since it's only one zero, this stage uh, performs wiring fully checked at compile time. Uh, that's how definition of a configurable block looks like in case you use this stage. You just declare your components, interfaces, and implementations, and define constraints for some of your declarations. And that's how we would enable uh, compile time checks for a this stage application. Uh, just one line in Tesco ensures that you will never get a runtime exception because of a, a missing component or a conflict between two components or a broken combination of configuration flags that you did not consider. Uh, to briefly describe how it works, since these stage plans all work ahead of time, we have access to all possible feature of components without to all possible feature configurations of components without having to execute any user code. We can traverse all of these possibilities at the same time uh, very efficiently and look for any mistakes in construction. We can then transfer the checking logic to compile time by wrapping it in a Scala macro. And then the only remaining challenges are that we have to somehow make the component definitions exist at compile time during our macro execution so that we can check them. And we also have to convince Scala's incremental compilation to rerun the macro when component definitions change. If we fail to do that, then the checks would be useless since they would not provide interactive feedback during development. Uh, actually, that, that's basically been the uh, status quo for some time. The, the checks did exist, but because they did not interact with incremental compilations, they were not useful at all. But so for the first part, because Scala macros can be can you load any GVM code they want and execute it as long as it's in a different module, then the easiest way to let the macro uh, get the values of component definitions is to place the macro call into the test code. For the purpose of the compiler, the test code is already a separate module, so it can execute any code from the main module during the compilation of the tests. Then, enabling incremental recompilation turned out to be much trickier than that. To do that, each component definition, as a class of plugin dev, now carries a phantom type parameter. The type of the parameter is generated by a macro and is different for every new compiler run. In that way, anyone who tries to create an instance of a plugin dev will be forced to recompile because uh, the type itself has changed. Uh, now, the check in macro in turn splices code that references the types of these plugin devs so that it can be picked up and recompiled whenever their super types change. And they would be changed any time that a plugin dev itself is modified or when any constructors that are mentioned inside of that body is modified, which in turn will cause it to recompile. So you may think that uh, probably executing a macro every time a relevant change to that would impact variant is done would somehow slow things down. But actually, uh, in Scala, we use thousands of macros. For example, in Scala test, a typical Scala test file would contain hundreds and hundreds of macro calls. The thing is, executing optimized code directly on the same GVM that is running the compiler turns out to be much, much faster than having to go through many layers of encoding what you want using types, using implicits, and then all of this going through more interactive importation by the type checker and the implicit resolution over. If you want an example, for example, compare the running times of type level Fibonacci sequence versus the regular runtime Fibonacci sequence. The type level version stops terminating very quickly. Uh, but now it's time to say a couple of words about the BO part of the framework. Uh, here is a relationship diagram of the BO type process. Each type class has a trifunctor and a bifunctor version. Uh, the trifunctor version is here, O and three, and the bifunctor is then in two. Uh, 
So, Bio has a unique and very convenient feature. It allows you to invoke type plus methods as conveniently as you would if you work with monomorphic code, such as deep zero without giving up the model error. You just import F from your Bio, from the Bio package and you can access all of your type plus methods using the F prefix. Bio has another unique feature. It does not require any wildcard syntax imports to use. ID auto imports are always enough to start using infix operators such as flat map, map, catch all, and any other type of operators. So in our experience teaching juniors into Scala, they do not even notice that Bio is there. They can start coding right away and we can focus on teaching them the actual functional paradigm itself rather than the intricacies of encoding of syntax extensions and implicits and all the meaningless scrub that mainstream functional libraries add that in case of Zoom and IDA just takes care of automatically. Uh, we also provide shims to convert biotype process into equivalent class effects ones. So you can keep using great libraries in the type level ecosystems such as Dubin and H4S without mixing many different type of hierarchies in your code. You can just use bio everywhere. Uh, in conclusion, I would say that uh, Bio provides you a way to implement modularity and type level with typeless final style and ensure it's not broken. DStage provides you the best possible modularity for static global context, and the contrarian type parameter of CO reader complements DStage with great modularity for local and dynamic contexts. Uh, so it's in what zero and zero together make the most productive Scala stack of 2021. Is battle tested and completely compile time safe. So there is no excuse anymore not to use it. Consider it for your next file project or adopt it in the existing one. All right, thank you. That was a great uh, Thank you for listening. Uh, if you wish, you may visit our GitHub or subscribe to our Twitter. Um, and probably go to a special chat for uh, Q and A. Um, let, let me move, move back to Paul. Oh, thank you, everyone.